John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, we do stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And I do have that passage up here for you, so you can read along with us if you do not have a Bible in front of you. John chapter 10, the first 10 verses we do use, I always preach from the King James text. <coughs> that is not to say I don't use other texts for reference, but I preach from the King James. John 10, 1 through 10, we stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers." This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while this afternoon on the topic, how do we enter? Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. King Jesus, once again, Lord, we come before you humbly. Lord, we come before you today hungry to hear from the word of God. Master, today men would fill pulpits, women today would fill pulpits and would offer words of their own imagination, would offer words that originated in their own hearts, their own minds. They were trying to be an encouragement, perhaps an inspiration. But Father, today we believe and we know that you call men and women to ministry that they might hear from heaven and in turn they might deliver unto the people of God a word fitly spoken, a word, God, that is right and perfect for that moment and that time and that hour. I believe, God, that I've heard from you for this moment in time. I believe, Lord, you've placed a message in my heart and that as the minister of the gospel, that you would have me to deliver it to the people of God. Lord, today, that the anointing might rest upon me, let me deliver it this hour as a sumptuous meal, and not merely as a snack, not merely as a cracker, but today, God, that it might be nourishment to our soul, it might be encouragement, to our spirit, it might be inspiration to our hearts. And most of all, God, it might be life to our soul. Send forth your word this hour to heal, to save, to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you this afternoon. You may be seated. Amen. I've seen preachers forget to tell folks they can be seated and they just stand there. 
<laughs> and they wait all service long. Is he ever going to tell us to sit down? Amen. You know, those of us of the apostolic faith are often looked upon as being narrow-minded. You know, we're, we're too narrow-minded. We don't. We don't preach the same exact message that is preached in the majority of churches in America, certainly around the world today. Our message is a little different. Well, where our message differs is in a couple of areas. One, of course, is how we view God and how we define God and how we see God. We see God and understand the Bible teaches God is a spirit. And when you are a spirit, you cannot be defined with the word uh, persons. You cannot apply the word persons to God because persons is entirely inappropriate. That, that's putting a human term on a spiritual God, and it doesn't work. God is not a person. He is not a persons. He is not three persons. He is a spirit, period. Jesus Christ was a person. And the word of God said that it pleased God that all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him bodily. So when we look at Jesus Christ, we see the personage of God. Amen. We see God in the flesh. We see how God lives. We see how God breathes. We see how God acts. We see how God loves. We see his compassion. We see his mercy. We see his love. Am I telling the truth? The problem we have with a lot of folks in a lot of churches today, the Jesus they preach isn't the one that I read about in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The Jesus they preach doesn't look like the Jesus that I read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Jesus I read about was a whole lot more compassionate. The Jesus I read about was a whole lot more affirming. Right. He didn't ask people what their lifestyle was before he received them. Am I telling the truth now? Right. He didn't ask if they were a hooker. He didn't ask if they were homosexual. He didn't ask if they drank or not. He didn't ask if they did drugs. He didn't ask what religion they belonged to. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Amen. No, he welcomed them with open arms. Because the transforming power of God is found in his love. Oh, we got people today trying to transform the world and they're trying to make it more godly and more righteous by their definition anyway, by manipulating politics and working with worldly orders and worldly systems. But the truth of the matter is if the church would live and love like Jesus, we would see things transformed by the power of God. It's supposed to be about him, not about us. Right. Hello now. Everything we do ought to be done by him, not by us. Amen. The Bible said in the book of Acts that the Lord working with them, confirming their word with signs following. Isn't it funny he wasn't confirming their politics? <laughs> Isn't it funny he wasn't confirming their picket lines? Hello now. No, they preached the word. I'm going to tell you something. If more preachers and more churches would get more busy preaching the word and living and loving like Jesus did, we would see a decline in abortions in America. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have to be having people out there picketing in front of clinics and bringing condemnation and guilt down on women's heads who are already struggling. Who are already going through one of the hardest times likely of their lives. And I, all I know is God didn't call me to do that. He never told me to do that. That is not the appropriate response. That is not the appropriate way to try to affect positive change in our world. Amen. The positive way is to preach the word. To live and love like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, what's the other way that we differ from a lot of other churches and denominations and movements? Well, one of the ways we differ, uh, Lisa, is in what we preach as the means whereby we enter in. See, a lot of people preach Jesus. He is the topic of their message. But when they get to salvation, see, when you look at what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, his sermon was all about Jesus. Okay, Jesus was the topic of his message. 
But the problem is, when you get to the question of, okay, now that we understand who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what he accomplished for us, how do we access that? How do we enter? Have you ever gone to a place of business, you know, and you park your car and you get out and you walk toward the building and you're looking all over the place and, and you can't find a door for all the money in the world? Doesn't that drive you nuts? I'm telling you, there, I remember one time, especially it was uh, uh, International House of Pancakes. I swear they didn't want anybody coming in there to buy anything because it was as if they built the restaurant and they failed to put a door on it. You know, you're looking high and low, you're walking left and right, and you're trying to find the entrance. Where in the world is the entrance? Well, the problem today is many people preach an entrance. Many churches and preachers and pastors and denominations will try to tell you how you get in. They'll t tell you all about Jesus, and then when you say, well, now how do I get in? All right, I understand that he's the door, but how do I get in, Johnny? That's the question. Well, on the day of Pentecost, they asked Peter that question. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we get in? Where is the entrance? And the Bible tells us in Acts 2.38, Then said Peter unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how you get in. Hallelujah. That's how you take the door and make it work for you. Praise God. That is what everything God has made available to us. That is how we access it. That's the hinge that opens the door. Hallelujah. All you got to do is repent and be baptized. Jesus said in Mark 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I've actually had people try to argue with me. Well, bless God, he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he said, He that believeth not shall be damned. He didn't say anything about not being baptized to be damned. I said, well, of course not, because if you don't believe, what's the sense of being baptized? <laughs> Why would he say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not and is baptized. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense either, right? He that believeth not and is not baptized. Well, if you don't believe, then it's no wonder you're not going to be baptized. Am I telling the truth? Just common sense. But James told us, faith without works is dead being alone. Faith without works, without action. The problem we have a lot of times is people read words that are translated according to the King James text, and they don't understand that not every time you read the word works in the King James is it translated from the original word or does it have the same meaning. So James is not saying you've got to work your way into heaven. You've got to do works in order to get into heaven. But what James is saying is Faith without action is dead being alone. If you don't act on what you claim to believe, then that what you claim to believe doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Right. I've used the analogy over the years. I use it all the time because I think it's a good analogy. If a fella ran in this building right now, Homeless, disheveled, you know, his clothes all dirty and stinky and booze on his breath to the point you could smell him across the room. And he walked in and said, hey, you need to get out of this building because it's on fire. The building's on fire. You need to get out. I dare say most of us would just stay seated and probably look at the preacher like, well, what are we going to do? How are you going to handle this? Right? Because you don't trust the messenger. The, the messenger doesn't come across to you as being trustworthy. You're not certain he's telling you the truth. But now if a man come in wearing fireman's guard, having his helmet on and having his fireman's coat on and his old rubber pants and his big old black boots, and he said, folks, y'all need to get out of this building. It's on fire. Chances are most of y'all would be up and out of the building. I'd still be up here talking. 
Because you believe that messenger. You trust what he's telling you. Am I telling the truth? But you see, if you believe him, you're going to do what he says. Now, if you really believe that fireman, you're not going to just sit here and stare at me. Like, well, what do we do next, Pastor? No. If you believe that fireman, you're going to get up and start moving before I ever say a word about him. I tell the truth. Yes, because when you believe something, you act upon it. And that is the nature of the gospel. That is why the Lord said, He that believeth and is baptized. That is why Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Because our faith alone, James says, means nothing. You've got to follow it with action. Baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is putting feet on our faith. That is the prescribed response. It is not man-made response. You see, I grew up in the fundamentalist church. I was told that if you come down to the front of the church when the pastor gave the altar call and you repeat this prayer after him, that you were going to leave born again, saved, a brand new person in Christ Jesus. Well, that's all well and good. But I cannot find one example of anyone in the Bible being saved that way. There is not one single example of anyone in Scripture... Walking through the door that is Jesus by repeating a prayer after somebody else. Can you find an example of that? It's not there. Where's the word sinner's prayer? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible do you read sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Bible. But you see how many folks are trying to get into the kingdom based on that message. How many people today have gone to church and they believe they're in the they're in the fold of safety based on that message. Oh, pastor, you apostolic folk, you're just too narrow. You're just too narrow-minded. You're, you're, just, you're just trying to make things too skinny for folks. You know, we're, we believe that it's a wide, you know, entrance that God just takes everybody. If you come at God any old way you want to come at God, he'll take you. Ooh, okay. I'm glad you believe that. Question is, can you give me a scripture to support that? <laughs> no. God tells you how you get in. You don't tell him. Am I telling the truth? Right. I got news for you. That old, uh, that old uh, pancake house. They told me how to get in. I didn't tell them. I couldn't just walk up to a solid wall and say, okay, I want the door to be here, and boom, I walked in. No, it don't work that way. i got to find the way that they've made. Am I telling the truth? Yes. I've got to find the door wherever they put it. Yep. And God wants us today to understand that he wants us to find the entrance. He wants us to find the door. He's got preachers out there telling you where it's at. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the word of God said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, the gate, and narrow is the way. Combined in my words. Gate and way. Gay. <laughs> which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I've got news for you today. I'm not the one who's made the entrance narrow. Hello now. I'm not the one that made this way narrow, Martin. No, the Lord did. He said, straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. No, it's our job to do things God's way, not to expect God to coalesce to our desired way. Lord, I want to get into heaven just because I prayed a prayer. Well, that's all well and good, but I've asked you to do more than that. I've asked you to put feet on your faith. I've asked you to be baptized. Listen, in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 42, the Word of God tells us Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, 
both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word prayed the sinner's prayer after him. <laughs> no. Oh, it don't say that, does it? No, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. What was the response on the day of Pentecost of those who believed what Peter had to say? They were baptized. How do we know that people are added to the church? How do we count people being added to the church of Jesus Christ? Because uh, they come down and sign a membership card? No, they're baptized. You're baptized into the body of Christ. You're baptized into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the measurement that the early church used. And the word of God tells us that they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. So they didn't leave that place and start preaching a pray this prayer after me message. No, they left that place preaching the same message Peter just preached to them. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Listen today, folks. The Word of God tells us in Mark chapter 16. Some of this you've already heard me quoting, so I'm kind of being rep repetitious a little bit. Mark 16, 15 through 18. And he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Uh, that says, and if they drink. Doesn't say when they drink. So you don't just bring in strychnine into the church house and start gobbling it down because you're trying to prove your faith. It doesn't say that, that we're supposed to make this part of our worship service. You will not find any containers up here containing rattlesnakes, okay? So if you're ready to run out the door because you're not sure, uh, get that out of your head. <laughs> get that out of your head. We're not, we're not going to do that, okay? Amen. If they, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So the message today, how? Do we enter? How do we get it? How do we make use of that door that is Jesus? It's easy. We believe the gospel, and in response to that faith, we're baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Pastor, are you sure that's the message? I know this is real simple. This is almost more like a Bible study today than a sermon, but I hope it's, I hope it's right. It's what I feel like God laid on my heart today to share. Romans 6, verses 3 through 7, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. But what did Paul say in verse number 3? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the purpose of baptism is to baptize us into Christ, into the body of Christ. That's why they counted conversions. They counted those who had come to the Lord based on baptisms, the number who were baptized. There are many people who believe, but they were not baptized. They were not counted as having been added to the church. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, faith without works is dead. we got to follow our faith with action, not our own action, not an action of our own design or our own imagination, but God's prescribed action. And God says, all I want you to do in response to your faith is be baptized. Hallelujah. It's pretty easy. It's not a hard thing. How are we to be baptized? Well, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, you couldn't make it any clearer than Peter preached it. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So guess what that means? Didn't matter whether you were a Roman occupy in Palestine or whether you were a Jew who lived in Palestine. Every one of you means, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your background, regardless of who you are or where you come from, you're to be baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason? For the remission of sins. Amen. You see, Peter on the day of Pentecost, he made it abundantly clear what baptism was all about. He didn't, he didn't leave anything open. Who's to be baptized? Every one of you. How are you to be baptized? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason? For the remission of sin. Where did he leave anything open? Where did he leave any un unanswered questions? He didn't. He answered them all. He told us who, when, where, and how. Hallelujah. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. I love getting older. <laughs> I can't, can't see a thing without these spectacles on, right? Remember when I was a kid in church and the preacher would be up there in the pole, you know, with his glasses down on the tip of his nose and he, he has to stand about six feet away to read. Now I'm him. <laughs> Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Notice there's a qualifier here in what Paul said. He said, for, many, uh, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So he, he didn't say... Everybody's put on Christ. If you believed on the Lord, you put on Christ. He said, no, no, no. Those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Do you hear me now? He said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. One of the areas where we apostolic folks differ from a lot of churches is in where that door is and how you use the door. We don't differ in our message as to who the door is. Je Jesus is the door. Amen. Amen. And I don't apologize to anybody. I know there's a lot of affirming churches out there today that'll tell you it don't matter if you're Hindu or you're Buddhist or you're this or you're that. You just come to God any old way you want to come to God and God's fine with it. I'm sorry I don't believe that. I believe Jesus is the way. I believe Jesus is the truth. I believe Jesus is the life. I don't believe he's a way. I don't believe he's a truth. I don't believe he's a life. I believe he is the singular way to God. I believe that God went to great lengths in order to reveal himself to humanity. 
Man, when you look at the entire plan of God going back to Abraham and the covenant he made with Abraham, and then you look at the uh, descendants that Abraham had, Isaac and Jacob, and then the sons of Jacob through two wives. Oh, I wonder what that does to those who believe that marriage has always been between one man and one woman from the beginning of time. Baloney. <laughs> Oh, preacher, you're not supposed to get into any area that, you know, could be considered, you know, any kind of controversy. Oh, honey, I swim there. <laughs> I don't just dip my toe in it. I like to swim in controversy. That's the biggest crock of nonsense anybody ever preached since the beginning of time. The entire nation of Israel is dependent upon two women that were married to good old uh, uh, Jacob. Two women, folks. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me marriage has been between one man and one woman from the beginning of time. It's always been that way in antiquity because you're full of malarkey. It ain't so. Because God's whole plan of salvation rested upon two women being married to one man. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Yeah. I also, got new, I also blow your socks off. Don't you know God put a hooker in the lineage of Jesus? <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm telling you, God just loves to blow the socks off of people. You get too religious and God will find a way to just knock your socks off. <laughs> he knows how to knock people off their pedestal real quick. Oh, no, God found a way to get a harlot in the bloodline. <gasps> Lord have mercy. Is it any wonder Jesus attracted prostitutes and the like to be part of his following? Is it any wonder? Well, good grief in his own lineage, he had some of these characters. Amen. My Bible said that the religious folk didn't want him, so he sent his servants out into the highway and the byway and invited everybody that the religious folk thought weren't worthy, that it invited everybody the religious folk thought wouldn't be interested. Oh, isn't it funny how many religious folk there are out there today that don't think we'd be interested in this gospel? Isn't it funny how many religious folk out there today think we wouldn't be interested in being in church today? But you know what? We are. Hallelujah. We do love the Lord. We do want a relationship with God. We do believe the gospel. We do want to obey the gospel. So guess what? Once again, your cock of me thinking is wrong. Hallelujah. And my faith is accounted unto me for righteousness. That's what the Bible says. You see, unlike some people in some churches, I don't stand up before God and tell him how righteous I am. Mm -mm. I thank him for how righteous I am. Oh, yeah. Well, pastor, that's crazy. If you could thank him for being righteous, why couldn't you tell him how righteous you are? Oh, because, see, my righteousness isn't of me. It's of him. Hallelujah. My righteousness is by faith. Doesn't have nothing to do with me. So that's why I thank him. I don't tell him about it. I thank him for it. Hallelujah. Yeah. God, because of what you did on Calvary, you see me as the most perfect kid you ever had. Hallelujah. I've told you before, have you ever seen a parent who has a kid, and I mean that kid, you'd like to slap them through a wall? <laughs> Am I the only one who's ever seen a kid that you just about wanted, you know, you found yourself, you found yourself taking your belt loose, you know, say, whoa, wait a minute, that's not my kid. And there's mom, isn't he an angel? Isn't he wonderful? And you want to say, lady, are you blind or stupid? Which one? Pick one. That kid ain't wonderful. He's wretched. But you know what? He can't do any wrong in mom's eyes. I got news for you today. Because we have believed and obeyed God's gospel, because we've come through the door the way God told us to come through the door, God looks at us and says, that's the best kid there ever was. I'm going to tell you what. I love my kid. My kid is good by me. But don't you see the wrong he does? No, I don't. No, I don't. Matter of fact, I don't. Matter of fact, I don't. See, he's dead to sin. Hello now. As many as us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All God sees me as is the little Jesus walking around. 
All he sees me as is a miniature Christ. Hallelujah. All he sees in me and of me is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Oh, my sin, all of that's already buried. My body ain't dead yet, but my soul that would have died is gone. It's buried. Now I've got a living soul, hallelujah, that's just waiting for the rapture so I can get caught up together with him in the air. Glory to God. Yeah, we're one of them churches that believe in the rapture. We're one of them churches that believes the Lord's coming. Now, you know what? I'm not, I'm not one of them churches that tries to scare you to death and scare you into the altar. But it could be any second now. Glory to God. <laughs> you know, them, I grew up with them old preachers in the assemblies of God. <laughs> well, the Lord could come in any second. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And you might leave this church and get hit by a car and you'll miss heaven. And... <laughs> Folks, don't come to the Lord because you're scared to death of hell. Come to the Lord because you love him. Come to the Lord because you appreciate what he did for you at Calvary. Come to the Lord and love him because he first loved you. That is the terms that God wants you to come to him on. He doesn't want you to come to him because you're scared to death of him. He doesn't want you to come to him because you're terrified of what might happen if you don't. Amen. My Lord have mercy. Say, Pastor, you're the first preacher I ever heard say that. <laughs> Most preachers try to scare me to death to get me into that altar. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. Relationships that begin with fear don't end well. That's right. Ask any young woman who gets into an abusive relationship with a gentleman. Oh, what? Ask her how well that relationship <laughs> ends. Right? Early on in the relationship, he's abusive. He, you know, you better love me because I said love me. You better care about me because I said care about me. You better do my bidding because I said do my bidding. Uh, those relationships don't end well. But as somebody who experienced good old fan, I'm getting romantical here. I'm turning into a Disney cartoon. You know, love at first sight. You see that person and you're really crazy about them and you just want to serve them. You want to do things. They don't ask you to do nothing, but you just, now booby, hush. <laughs> the minute I said that they don't ask you to do nothing, I just heard him say, oh, well now wait a minute, hold up now. <laughs> I'm not talking about asking for a Dr. Pepper or, or an ice cream out of the freezer. That's a different ball of wax, so I, I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking about making demands of you. You know, make me breakfast. I expect dinner on the table at 6 o'clock when I come home from work. You know what I'm talking about. Got news for you, children. That is not the God we serve. That is not the God we serve. The more you get to know the Jesus that I preach anyway, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to love him crazy. You're going to be so crazy about him, you're going to be happy to do things for him. You're going to be happy to come to church. You're going to be happy to live the Christian life. You're going to be happy to be sober and to be uh, of sound mind and not be out there drinking yourself crazy. Not because the pastor got up every Sunday and preached you into hell if you get drunk. I don't do that. No, I'm too busy trying to help you fall in love with him. Folks, he's made a way. He's created an entrance into a place that at one time we had absolutely no access to. The kingdom of God. The Bible said what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law couldn't get you into the kingdom. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. There was no door. The law didn't create a door. Mm -mm. All the law did was point you in the direction of the door that was to come. Hallelujah. They were looking forward to Messiah. They were looking forward to the arrival of Jesus. But it didn't create a door. You can only stand outside the kingdom of God. You can only stand outside heaven's gates and kind of peek through the bars. Jesus came and he said, I am the door. I am the door. Hallelujah. I've made a way for you to not only be able to look in, but I've made a way for you to get in. How do we get in? How do I enter? It's simple, folks. It's 
a simple message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Guess what? There is no qualifier on there. Nowhere in there does it say you've got to be straight. Nowhere in there does it say you've got to be white. Thank God nowhere in there is to say you've got to be skinny. <laughs> <laughs> it just says repent and be baptized. When I started, I'm trying to close right now. When I started my affirming ministry back in 93, I envisioned people in our community, Lisa, just flooding in to our church. I really did. I pictured thousands of people just flooding in. You know why? Because... How wonderful it would be when LGBT, LGBT people finally realized that they had access through Christ. That there was nothing that kept them out. There was nothing that barred them. There was nothing that denied them access. I thought, man, whoo, when folks start hearing that and when they start realizing that, they're going to flood into our church. I was wrong. <laughs> I wasn't quite right. But you know what? God has the people. Mm -hmm. God has the people. We're here today, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Yep. I got news for you. There, there are thousands of people going to watch this message online. We get eight to 10,000 views a month on our websites mm -hmm. online. There's a lot of people in a lot of communities around the world who have been told that they have no access to God, who have been told that God has no interest in them and he's not wanting to deal with them and he's not about to receive them. And this old chubby preacher is letting them know that ain't so. Amen. The gospel offers no qualifiers. Nowhere in the message does it say you've got to be this or you've got to be that. It says if you can believe and obey... You can receive and you can benefit. Jesus Christ came that we might have life, he said, and that we might have it more abundantly. I'm going to tell you, we're, Booby and I are going on 17 years. This December is 17 years that we've been knowing each other. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Legal now, you know, for a few, for three. That wasn't my fault. That was the Supreme Court. But I'm going to tell you, we've been blessed, and we've been blessed, and we've been blessed, and God has been so good to us. Every time we sit and talk about it, just the other day, Saturday, we were in the car, and I said, I said, man, hasn't God been good to us? Haven't we been blessed? I'm going to tell you something, children. Straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You can have it more abundantly. We got a couple of guys sitting in the back of the church over here right now. Bless God, they done had a Cadillac given to them. And then after they have a Cadillac given to them, they have a 2007 Chevy uh, Impala sold to them for a price that I couldn't buy it for if I, if, if I tried. Better than wholesale. I'm telling you, God will bless you. God will work with you. God will be on your side. The Lord will he'll make your life a life abundant. Hallelujah. If you give them half a chance. How do I get in? How do I enter? Enter through the door. I'm going to tell you, Muhammad won't get you there. I hate to tell you. Buddha won't get you there. But Jesus will. Jesus will. Am I telling the truth? How many believe Amen. Jesus is the way? Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?